thousands of years that ships have fought at sea, perhaps no single battle revolutionized naval warfare as much as the Battle of the Coral Sea. It was fought not by battleships and cruisers and destroyers, but in the air. Not once did the opposing surface ships come within sight of one another. Instead, in the skies overhead, Navy pilots engaged their enemy. The story of that battle is a landmark in the history of aircraft carriers. The men who have made history from the decks of aircraft carriers have always been inseparable from the flying machines they love. Bringing their birds home to roost on the roof of their floating home required all the skill they could muster after the tension of combat. You come around and your approach pattern at your minimal speeds. Uh, you turn into the groove and you just catch the eye of that, uh, of that signal officer and you'd love him all the more. You saw his hands out and you just bring your board. Carl C. in May 1942, the first naval air battle, there was Midway in June. The engagement that turned the tide against the Japanese forces. Midway, where aircraft carriers and the planes they launched proved again the strategic value of the Navy's ungainly floating airfields. To protect themselves, the carriers covered their sky with fighter combat air patrols. If the enemy should get through, the crossfire of anti-aircraft guns would take over. In that deadly airspace over the Japanese fleet, what was it like to push over a dive bomber at two miles up and go whistling down to a gun-filled deck? Uh, you were keyed up, of course, and you were apprehensive of what was taking place, uh, but due to the fact that we'd had many training missions, we were real seasoned. So I think the only, the only uh, uh, thing that you had was the apprehension of, uh, of whether you're gonna make that bomb hit on that deck or not. But you were kind of thinking of that only, nothing else. There was nothing else in your thoughts. You were just doing the job that you were trained to do, and that was it. Bob Ryder, radio man and gunner, tells how it looked from the rear seat. The radio would normally call out the altitude to the pilot as he's coming down. 9,000, 8,000, 7,000. At 2,000 feet, you'd haul a drop. But then we'd uh, level the plane out. At this point, you were beginning to look out for this uh, heavy uh, flak. And you could uh, see this pattern of uh, explosions behind you, and you could hear this old bulldog-type sound going woof, woof, woof. You'd tell the pilot to pull it up, and this woof, woof sound would go underneath it. For the fighter pilots, even though they worked in teams, it was still, in the end, one man alone in his plane. What does it take to make a good fighter pilot? Gene Valencia, a top Navy ace who won 23 and lost none, sums it up. He has to be aggressive. He has to love to fight. He has to love to tangle. But he does not, and he cannot do it foolishly. He has to know the performance of his aircraft. It's that simple. Simple? Another Navy pilot, Hamilton McWhorter, remembers that combat flying is not an occupation that accepts errors of judgment. You don't get a chance to make but one mistake. Usually that one mistake is, is the last one. Landing a plane on a carrier deck, a moving, rolling, pitching platform, also allows few mistakes. It was like putting a or a match alongside of a swimming pool. And then you thought to yourself, are we going to make it on that little thing? David McCampbell, the Navy's top World War II fighter ace. We've always had a man back on the platform with the landing signal officer. And his job to watch for hooks and wheels down when the plane is well back in the groove, long before time for him to land. 
To a carrier pilot, no two landings are alike. Lieutenant Skip Phelps explains how it is. It's always something different. The day is different, the sea is different, the wind's different. Now this is two years for me. Today it's as new as it was two years ago. As a capital ship of many of the world's navies, has a birthright extending back to the Wright brothers. Not a sleek greyhound of the sea, not a mighty battle wagon. She is a composite, a floating airfield, a battle command center, a city of men, 3,500 hard-working men. The carriers took shape by trial and error, by the changing necessities of their age. Their development was always wedded to the refinements in the design of the aircraft that flew on and off their flat top decks. This was a marriage of convenience, unsure at first, but a marriage that has grown in importance. Today, their 20th century machinery demands crews that include highly trained technicians, engineers, electronic specialists. The floating airstrips of World War II have doubled in size to become airports like the USS John F. Kennedy and the nuclear-powered Enterprise and Nimitz with flight decks covering four and a half acres. This mobile airbase, the Kennedy, can steam to any trouble spot at 600 nautical miles a day. Her airplanes can go to 85% of the world's surface. The Kennedy is free to roam where it chooses. Over the years, American carriers have protected friends and stood off would-be enemies. In peace as in war, they have been the shield and the power of America in a world where no day goes by without threat and crisis. A ship is nothing by itself but steel and machinery. When you put people aboard, it becomes a living thing. And it was with people, visionary and insistent, that the aircraft carrier had its beginning in the first decade of the century. The year is 1909. William Howard Taft is our president. The automobile is still a newcomer in our streets. Hardly have we succeeded in propelling ourselves along the ground on four wheels with the gasoline engine, than the Wright brothers have used it to propel themselves through the air. Now, Orville Wright is demonstrating a later model at Fort Myer, Virginia. Navy Lieutenant George Sweet, attending as an observer, reports back, the Navy must have that. It will be most important to us. With these words, he sets in motion forces that will change history. The Navy's first experiments with the flying machine are directed toward a design that will land and take off from the water. Recently, the blueprints for this fragile machine were dusted off, and a replica of the Navy's first aircraft soared out of history. But soon the question is raised, might an airplane be of greater use to the Navy if it could be flown to and from the deck of a ship? In 1910, at Hampton Roads, Virginia, a civilian pilot, Eugene Ely, tests the idea. He takes off in a 50 horsepower Curtis plane from a wooden platform built over the bow of a cruiser and lands safely ashore. But could a plane return to a ship and land safely on it? Two months later, in San Francisco Bay, Ely takes off from shore and lands on a platform rigged over the after deck of the cruiser Pennsylvania. Now an airplane has both taken off from and landed aboard a warship at sea. The implication for the Navy is revolutionary. The Navy's first pilot, Lieutenant Theodore Ellison, is already learning to fly with Glenn Curtis, a pioneer in aircraft design and construction. The first groups of Navy air pilots to win their wings contain men who will make naval aviation history. Men who will lead carrier aviation through a world war. 
Early in the century, there is no question that Britannia rules the waves. But Germany's Kaiser Wilhelm decides to challenge England with a naval race. British sea dogs, old hands at naval warfare, but always ready for new ideas, build His Majesty's ship Furious, the world's first aircraft carrier. The US Navy takes its own steps into the future by fitting three cruisers with catapults to launch planes. But as America enters World War I, the battleship continues to play the star role as the capital ship of the fleet. From shore bases on both sides of the Atlantic, Navy planes are the airborne eyes of the fleet, scouting for German submarines. Their brief missions are limited by the short range of the aircraft. Admiral William Sims, the commander of naval forces in Europe during World War I, tells a congressional committee, the fast carrier is the ship of the future. This same vision of the importance of aircraft at sea has struck a young Japanese naval attaché in Washington, Isoruku Yamamoto. In his words, the fiercest serpent can be overcome by a swarm of ants. Yamamoto, as a fleet admiral in World War II, will see the truth of this adage work triumphantly for him and disastrously against him. In the same year, Congress authorizes the conversion of the coal ship Jupiter to become a prototype aircraft carrier. In 1919, a flying boat with a far longer range is completed, the NC boat, N for Navy, C for Curtis. Designed for mid-ocean sub-patrolling, the NC comes too late to help in World War I. It makes another kind of history. Leaving Rockaway, New York, the NC-4 reaches Lisbon, Portugal, stretching the range of aircraft to the width of the Atlantic. But this first crossing of the ocean by a Navy flying boat will become a footnote in aviation history when it is eclipsed by later landmark flights. In 1921, while the Jupiter is still being rebuilt, the Navy undertakes a series of aerial bombing tests using captured German ships as targets. Under the command of Brigadier General Billy Mitchell, Army aircraft sink the battleship Ostfriesland. Our newspapers spread the word. Airplanes have made surface navies obsolete. The Navy quietly reminds us that the Ostfriesland was merely a sitting duck, unable to make evasive movements and unprotected by either its own guns or fighter planes. In 1922, the conversion of the Jupiter is finished. She is commissioned as our first carrier the USS Langley. At once, she's nicknamed the covered wagon. She is fitted with arresting wires across the landing area to catch hooks mounted between the wheels of her airplanes. The planes have no brakes and shoulder straps are yet to become standard cockpit equipment. In these days, Navy pilots with tongue in cheek define a successful landing as one which the pilot can walk away from. But scores of future air admirals will be among the thousands who will win their wings on the Navy's first carrier. It will become a proud boast for graying eagles to say, I flew off the Langley. That pilot in trouble, Lieutenant Gerald Bogan, will one day, as a rear admiral, command a carrier task group through an important battle in World War II. My tail hook, as it sometimes would happen, instead of engaging the arresting wire, rode one of these fore and aft wires, which caused the plane to slew to the left. There were several people, including Commodore Reeves, standing in the, in the gallery near the two smoke sacks on the port side, and I was afraid that my propeller would chew them up. So against all regulations, I gave her full throttle and I did a very beautiful wing over over the port side and into the drink. I was picked up by the plane guard. Retired Rear Admiral Leslie Garys was another Langley Eaglet. The qualification uh, consisted of three successful landings and takeoffs. And once you'd made three of them, you were a carrier pilot. And, of course, we built this thing up uh, 
those of us who were carrier pilots, we affected to look down our nose at all other aviators because we were Langley pilots. And we built this all up to be quite a thing. And then later when we got the other carriers, and it was our job to to, uh, to train and uh, classify other carriers, then we had to break it all down again and convince everybody it was easy and safe and nothing to it. But uh, that Langley was really something. The 1920s, the jazz age, the golden age of sports, and bathtub gin. The era of wonderful nonsense. Beneath the facade of frivolity, there is a desperate desire to prevent a second world war. At a Washington conference, the leading powers agree to cut down their navies. The treaty calls for the United States to cancel two battle cruisers under construction, the Saratoga and the Lexington but it permits the construction of aircraft carriers by conversion of these hulls. The Lexington becomes carrier number two and the Saratoga number three. One day they will play their roles on the Pacific stage, helping to stop an enemy from sweeping across the ocean. These are the years when man's imagination and ingenuity take him on ever lengthening journeys across the skies. Charles Lindbergh crosses the Atlantic and later demonstrates his skill by flying from an aircraft carrier. Airmail service begins. The United States wakes up to an age in which men are accepting the challenge of flight and enjoying the thrill of accomplishment in the sky. In 1929, Navy pilots practice their trade in a fleet exercise at the Panama Canal. Saratoga serves with the attackers and Lexington with the defenders. Making new ground rules, the attackers launch a pre-dawn airstrike. The results will catch the attention of many who scoff at the Navy's aviation program. Admiral Garys flew a fighter off the Saratoga. My squadron was assigned to uh, go after the what was then the Army Air Corps uh, airplanes over at the uh, the Army field on the Atlantic side of the canal. Everybody was just uh, absent, and we romped up and down the field and, in theory, destroyed all their aircraft. The uh, bombers went in, and the uh, scouts were bombing, and I think the other fighter squadron uh, uh, was romping around over Miraflores. Anyway, uh, by ooh, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, we were all through. Well, the umpires uh, declared that uh, the battle fleet had won the war, because the Panama Canal had been so damaged by this air attack that it was out of commission, couldn't function, was it established fleet aviation as a real combat arm of the fleet. In the years that follow, we add five more broad-shouldered heavyweights to the carrier force. Enterprise, Hornet, Wasp, Yorktown, and Ranger, proud names that reflect the heritage of the nation. Across the Pacific, a nation watches us and also builds carriers. As a Japanese Air Admiral will one day disclose, our principal teacher in respect to emphasizing aircraft carriers was the United States Navy. We were doing our utmost all the time to catch up with the United States. Naval aviators learn the thrill of aerial acrobatics, skills that will one day be used in combat. Admiral Garys remembers the fun of flying. And I never had so much fun in my life. But in those days, it wasn't, as I say, we were, to some degree, kind of pampered pets, prima donnas. We were developing dive bombing techniques. We were developing a formation and tactical technique. We had a pretty free hand. Hollywood, for the first time, makes screen heroes of this new generation in MGM's feature film, Helldivers. Wallace Beery and Clark Gable are the friendly rivals. I got a nice bet on you, Wendy. Good. Say, listen, all I wish there'd been real bullets in that gun up there today. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, if those had been real guns instead of cameras, they'd be kicking dirt in your face right now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and Baldy here, the uh, 
playing taps for you on a piccolo. <laughs> I don't like to play taps. Make me cry. <laughs> hey, listen, you can't be the guy that's been the champ of this outfit for five years. No? No. Hey, I've only been here five days, and you're through already. Oh. <laughs> In 1938, in another exercise, Navy pilots are launched from their carrier at dawn. Arriving unopposed, their theoretical attack is a great success. By the rules of the game, an American island fortress has been destroyed. Once more, air power from the sea proves its worth. The island base, Pearl Harbor. This time we have the Saratoga and the Lexington both on our side. And the idea was that we were going in and wreck the Navy Yard and attack and bomb and torpedo and sink any ships we could find there. In the meantime, the fighters would immobilize and, and pin down any Air Force fighters we found. Three years later, the Japanese did it practically the same way. Under the command of Admiral Yamamoto, Japanese carrier air power had challenged a fleet considered the strongest afloat. All our Pacific battle wagons are gone. The fiercest serpent had been overcome by a swarm of ants. What was left to stop Yamamoto from making the entire Pacific a Japanese lake? None of our seven carriers are at Pearl Harbor on December 7th. Of the three assigned in the Pacific, Saratoga is at San Diego, her home port. Lexington and Enterprise are steaming at sea. From the Atlantic fleet, the Hornet, Wasp, and Yorktown will join the Pacific forces in 1942. The seventh carrier, Ranger, will serve in the Atlantic and Mediterranean until 1944. Meanwhile, Japanese forces are seizing vast areas of the Pacific. To let the enemy know we are still fighting, Vice Admiral Bull Halsey, commander of what's left of our Pacific fleet, sends his carriers on hit-and-run raids against the enemy shore bases. The enemy's flyers meet our attackers with skilled airmanship. Our naval aviators in combat for the first time fight against heavy odds. The enemy pilots are more experienced. Their fighter plane, the Zero, though lightly armored, is faster and more maneuverable than our Wildcat. Fighter ace Gene Valencia had great respect for his opponents. You didn't tangle with them alone. If you did, you were crazy. And I don't know any fighter pilot that will tell you he fought plane for plane with the Zero, and we did have to depend on each other. It was a matter of tactics. The rule was to fly always in formations of two or four fighters. And the basic tactic, conceived by Lieutenant John Thatch, became known as the Thatch Weave. You can't shoot anything if you can't bring your guns around the barrel. on it. I would ask myself, now what? should we do if we're flying along in a formation, let's say we've got four planes, two sections, and we saw an enemy. Well, if, you're, if you think the enemy can outperform you, you don't turn and run, because he can catch you, and, and you'll be easy target. You turn toward him. Try to keep turning toward him so he can't get on your tail. I wasn't sure how well this would work, so I went out one morning, and I got a hold of a young man named Butch O'Hare, and gave him four airplanes, and I took four. It really worked. Edward O'Hare, one of the first aviator heroes of World War II, helped perfect the art of night fighting, 
and scored feats like shooting down five enemy planes in a single engagement. One night, he didn't come back. Chicago's International Airport was given his name. Alexander Brashew, a top Navy fighter ace himself, flew with O'Hare as his wingman. He had a way of uh, presenting a problem not only in the air by example, but by quietly explaining it in a little more detail on the ground if needs be. But you got the message uh, rather quickly and uh, in a way that uh, it stuck with you. Little things like maybe conserving fuel, looking over your shoulder at the right time, or at least before making a run or making an attack. And I can safely say that I saved my life a couple of times by remembering little rules like this. In April 1942, a daring strike is ready that will hit the enemy exactly where he lives and let him know he is vulnerable. A squadron of 16 Army B-25 bombers will attack Tokyo from an unlikely airbase for the Army Air Corps, the deck of the USS Hornet at sea. For land pilots to lift heavy Army bombers from a carrier took months of training. Navy Lieutenant Henry Miller, now Rear Admiral, showed them how. Light loads at the start, medium loads, and then a final a uh, heavy load, which was 2,000 pounds over the maximum designed weight of the aircraft. It was a rough day. The wind was blowing, the seas were pretty high. We had to slow down the Hornet because we had so much wind over the deck and we were taking water over the bow. Jimmy Doolittle was the, the first one. Uh, he, of course, was a, was a crack aviator and uh, there wasn't a flaw in his technique. And it took uh, one hour to get the rest of the planes off. At precisely the time that the first plane was supposed to be over Tokyo, the Japanese radio went off the air. And then it came back on the air and was uh, talking about the enemy uh, planes over Japan shear went up all over the ship because we knew they got in there and were dropping their bombs. It was a tremendous shot in the arm for the great American public. Three weeks later, the Yorktown and Lexington in a far corner of the Pacific north of Australia steamed toward an enemy fleet. Facing them was the test for which the Navy had been training for 20 years. In the tradition of great battles at sea, Trafalgar, the Monitor and Merrimack at Hampton Roads, Jutland, the plains of the Saratoga and Lexington would meet their rendezvous with destiny over the Coral Sea. For the first time in history, a naval battle would be fought only in the sky. <laughs> 